Hey, Octavio, welcome. Uh, I definitely appreciate you uh, taking some time and being uh, on the podcast. So uh, definitely just want to thank you up front for that. Hello, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's something that I personally have wanted to you know, learn a little bit more about your backstory, um, obviously creating this new watch brand. And I think that there's a lot of other people out there that have seen the product and are definitely interested in the cool story behind it. So uh, I think this definitely will be uh, informative for everybody. I know that you've had quite a bit of experience in the watch world, to say the least. Uh, specifically, I know you came from uh, Omega at one point and, and a long time at Audemars Piguet. And uh, right. I just guess I'd really like to know a little bit more about kind of that experience, kind of what that was like and kind of what you took from that as you decided to, to start something on your own. Uh, yeah, I began my first steps in the watch industry with Omega, effectively. Uh, an incredible experience. You had a, a very strong product-focused um, company that really understood the, the importance of design in the, in the development process. That's one of the key learnings that, that, uh, that I got was really understanding the, the, the essence of the brand in order to be able to, to create products that were aligned with the brand's philosophy. And then from there, I went to Odma. Not so I guess, I mean, looking back on it, and I know that there are, you know, it's not just one watch that makes a brand famous, but the, the Royal Oak, uh, I mean, I know that you were uh, a part of that. Uh, I guess looking back on that, it's still an amazing experience just to say that it's such an iconic piece um, to, ha to say that you were a part of that for a number of years. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, 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 obviously, Old Marc Piguet is 11 years of, of my uh, of my design development as a, as a designer, it's, it's, it, it represents it represents a big part of my of my design my design career as a watch designer. Uh, at, at the same token, I would say that the experience that I had at Omega, uh, working on on Speedmasters and Constellations and the Aquaterra collection and Seamasters and uh, Cindy Crawford's choice and Pierce Bronson and and uh, uh, Michael Phelps was was just as enri enriching in in, in in a sense. And so, effectively, the icon that uh, everyone talks about is Royal Oak, and it's absolutely an important, a very significant, important watch in in, in the history of of, uh, of watch design. And and it and, and it is it is special to be a part of that. I feel privileged. To have been able to to work with uh, with the teams that that developed that piece back in '72, and uh, and to have been able to to also um, in in a way uh, when when I was involved with the company to to sort of make sure that at that moment when I was there the the product was going. In a, in a direction that I felt that that piece had to be at that time. Leading into the next part, I mean, such a cool experience with those two brands. And then you've decided to, back in, I think, 2016 is when you started, you started your own watch brand. So what was it, the decision that led you to say, okay, I've, I've put in my time here, I've had an amazing experience, but now I'm going to go ahead and, and, and try to do this, uh, my own watch brand. Like, what was that decision like? Well... I have to say that after 11 years with, with Odma, uh, I felt that it was really time for a change, time for something new. Um, and uh, I had always, in the back of my mind, had the idea of, of starting something on my own. And so um, in 2015 was, was that moment, was that time that uh, I felt uh, there was an opportunity. I felt that there was uh, a, an opening uh, there was a space that was that was that was available that that, that we could really address that I could address at, with with something new and fresh and and different and bold. And so, speaking to that, like, and I think obviously that your experience led you to this. But like, what that void that you talk about, that piece that was missing, like. What, what was that? Like, what is it? Because there's a lot of watch brands that start out and a lot of new ones that come into the marketplace. But with your experience, like, what did you feel like that was missing? Well, for, first, uh, first of all, 
we, we felt this is kind of a general tendency that uh, speaking with uh, certain retailers, speaking with certain uh, clients, collectors, the accessible brands were starting to, to upscale for, for, for many different reasons and, and reposition themselves in terms of pricing. And so that was leaving some, some voids, some areas, uh, uh, some pockets of, 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 um, of opportunity. Um, and so uh, we also felt that in the, in the price segment between $1,000 and $4,000, um, there was less creativity. There was less experimentation with materials, with design. Uh, it seemed to us that, it seemed to me that uh, brands were, were, were much more focused on mass market products, which in a lot of ways makes sense in, in that price category. But we felt that there was an opportunity to create something special uh, that could connect in a, in a more personal way with a, with a more targeted audience. And moving into like what the actual, the brand is called, which is Gorilla. Um, it's, it's clearly a watch that is disrupting. It's a disruptor, right, in the, in the industry. And so I'm curious, what is the story behind the name? Because it's very unique, very cool. So what led you to that? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's disru a disruptor as much as it is uh, a statement. Uh, 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 it's, a, it's an author brand. It's a, it's a brand that, that uh, has a very um, strong um, design language that, that, that position, positions itself. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a very specific, in a, in a very specific way, and so we felt that the name had to be just as strong and just as positioning, and so um, and we wanted something in a way that uh, that was either you liked it or or you didn't like it, but regardless, you would never forget it. And and we felt that Gorilla uh, really ticked those boxes for us. I wanted to ask you, so. There, the, the concept behind Gorilla obviously is related to muscle cars and the American muscle cars specifically. And I know that you have a passion for, for that. And tell us a little bit about, about that, that, where that came from. Yeah, it's true that, uh, I mean, I was born and raised in Chicago. My, my dad was, uh, was uh, like a, a part-time mechanic. He liked tinkering with cars. And so I, I was always uh, uh, muscle cars, not, not only muscle cars, but cars from the 70s, 80s, 90s were, were, were always uh, around the house. And uh, my dad would always push me to go and help him, you know, tinker around with these cars. So um, the smell of gasoline and, and uh, oil and all this was, was, uh, was kind of a weekend thing for us. So that, that's, that's part of the, part of the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the attraction that I have to these, these machines, uh, they're so analog and so visceral and, and, uh, and, and, but also the muscle car, car world and car culture more in, more in general, car culture is such a, such a rich visual culture, whether it's, uh, Japanese, Japanese, uh, sports cars or American muscle or European, um, uh, sports cars, they, they all uh, have this sort of uh, emotional ingredient that I think is very comparable to the watch, to the watch world, you know. And uh, I think that uh, the terminology, the vocabulary is similar. Uh, we, we speak about horsepower and we speak about uh, frequencies and, uh, and um, power reserve and and, and, and all, so there, there's this shared vocabulary between these two worlds that I felt really fit well together with, with, uh, with the idea that we wanted to, to build around the brand world that is Gorilla today. Yeah, it's, um, I think the thing is that you see a lot of brands uh, that try to do something with maybe a car brand and it never seems to really work out too well, right? Like you never see, there is obviously a few, but you know, there are partnerships that, that put the brand on the watch. And with you guys, it's obviously not the case, but 
very around that, as you said, talked about the concept of the muscle car and the colors that go into it and obviously the materials. So I think that that really resonates right. well with with people that obviously have a, the similar appreciation to to cars that you do. Yeah. And in fact, um, one of one of our benchmarks when, when we began really thinking about the brand world, building this world around the product, uh, one of the benchmarks was actually Breitling. Um, the the Breitling, uh, Breitling at one point was really focused on aviation and uh, and the products were 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 conceived in that way. The, 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 obviously, there's a history and uh, uh, there's a lineage that that, that goes uh, that goes across that brand at that time. That, that and we we Lucas and I both appreciate the sort of clarity, the clear message, and the link to the product was so strong that in in a lot of ways we wanted to emulate that with our brand. You know, uh, a very strong, clear, understandable message speaking to an audience again of like-minded people, passionate about mechanics, passionate about and this, this analog emotional connection to a machine. Uh, and, and, uh, and we felt that, yeah, if, if I had to take a, if I had to pick a brand that sort of was a benchmark, it would be Breitling, the, the, the whole pilot era of Breitling. Looking at the watch, right. And getting into kind of the materials of it, like the watch is a very different look. Um, talk to us a little bit about like why you chose that specific shape for the majority of the pieces. Mm -hmm. So, um, a, a lot of that comes from, uh, I would say the, it, the Omega influence, if you want. And I know that oftentimes people will tell me, yeah, I see, I see some elements of offshore and I see, and and obviously the materials that we used, I mean, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to be able to experiment with, with forged carbon and ceramic and, um, and all these cutting edge materials throughout my time at Odma. But I would say that uh, one of the periods that I, I really, not periods, but products, more specifically products that, that I really always appreciated was uh, 125th anniversary Omega Speedmaster that we, uh, I say we because um, uh, a friend of mine had this piece. I, I really love this, the, the shape of this watch. It was, uh, um, I affectionately called it the washing machine because it had a sort of washing machine shape to it with a, with a round dial opening and a, and a very tonal, bulky tonal shape uh, 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 case with an integrated uh, bracelet with, with quite a quite a fast uh, tapering, and uh, I was always intrigued by this watch. So it it that that watch has always stuck in my mind, and it sort of became the the uh, the, the 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 muse of 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 the fastback collection was this these these unique proportions, along along with the uh, with everything that's going on in, in the dial of, of that particular piece. So I would say that that was like that that piece was the starting point in terms of the proportions that you see today on on the fastback. Um, I want to touch on you mentioned the the materials, and I think that this is uh, a very important part because it is as well as you speak about a lot of the DNA of the brand to be able to use <clears throat> these unique materials that um, that you're using in these watches and be able to offer all of that at the price point that you're that these watches are priced at and these start at eight hundred and eighty dollars so can you talk a little bit about you know the the materials that go into it um, and how, and how you i guess wanting to keep it at that accessible level to everybody because it is an amazing watch with all of these materials for that price yeah. Well, it goes back to what we were discussing at the beginning. Uh, how how do you enter a saturated market uh, and, and make an impact and, and get attention? Uh, it's by offering something unique, a unique package. And uh, again, having worked with these materials before, I knew their, their uh, mechanical attributes, what they could really bring to uh, an end user, right? So um, the, the challenge then became 
finding a way to make it accessible, finding a way to, uh, through design, through, uh, through uh, manufacturing, um, uh, making, the, making the piece accessible. And it was, it was challenging. But we, we, we were able to do it and, uh, and do it in, uh, uh, in an aesthetically pleasing way, in a robust way. And to that point, you know, like utilizing the, uh, the forged carbon, uh, you, you use titanium case backs um, and the crown, and then you've got sapphire crystal, the anodized aluminum, and then the ceramic. What I appreciate is the fact that you guys some of the watches have this polished ceramic and then the other have like a brushed matte ceramic and you guys are, it's so well executed on each piece and gives people the option uh, of, of what that really kind of speaks to them as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, finishing is another, uh, another important aspect of, of the appearance of the watch, differentiating the different um, uh, references within, within a, a given collection. And uh, the, the bead blasted ceramic uh, will give you one appearance, one mood, and, and the, obviously the polished ceramic gives you a totally different, uh, um, a totally different watch. So uh, playing with these finishes uh, gives us uh, quite a quite a wide spectrum, along with uh, with a with the fantastic color palette that the anodized aluminum gives us, and um, also experimenting with different forged carbon um, sort of uh, um, fabrication processes in, in the future are also going to allow us to continuously um, offer up new new alternatives in, within the Fastback collection. You take it one step further, which I think that this is, um, I guess, really where it comes from your experience in the in the watch business and i guess the relationships that you've created um with the high-end complications that that gorilla has which i think really adds this sexiness to the brand i mean obviously the watches all have a similar look but somebody is a watch collector or is looking for something different and unique especially again going back to like something that's accessible uh you've got this wandering hours movement and I know that that was in, uh, I think the the Audemars Piguet Star Wheel. Is that was that correct? Well, yeah, uh, Audemars, Audemars Piguet had. Uh, I think they launched the Star Wheel in 1991, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, yeah, that piece that's a very special piece, the Star Wheel. Uh, I discovered it when I first discovered it when I when I began. At Oma back in, in 2003, and I instantly fell in love with that with that movement because um, it really visually it's uh, it's uh, it's very complex, but in fact it's also very efficient in, in its conception, and uh, and so that that's what I really find uh, uh, fantastic about it. So yes, I the 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 when we decided to launch Gorilla, that specific movement was part of our uh, design agenda. It, it began first as, a, as a, an idea um, on paper, and, uh, then thanks to, to uh, friendships, I was able to present it to uh, the uh, technical director of Boucher, and uh, they were open enough and uh, encourage us to develop that 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 uh, module with them and that became actually the first module that Voshe ever manufactured for 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 a company for an independent brand was was the uh, the drift module yeah. but that's 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 where the comparison with the star wheel ends because in fact that uh, ultimately there 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 are two they're two quite different systems, despite the fact that they both have rotating satellite disks that, that indicate the hour. Uh, the star wheel has, um, has a, a spring. Uh, uh, in fact, it's called the star wheel because under each disk, it has a star shaped gear that's spring uh, loaded. And ours, our, our, um, 
our module has a, has a, a Geneva cross uh, system, which is really quite different. Each one have their, their pros and cons. And uh, so it's not exactly a star wheel. It's a wandering hour. And that wandering hour, that was the, your first piece that you, you launched back in 2015, 2016, correct? The first piece we launched was the Fastback original with the 8,000, with the 8,000 caliber. Yeah, that was the first piece we launched. We launched online yep. only, 500 pieces, limited edition, and uh, th it did very well, and it allowed us to slowly gain momentum and be the first uh, Fastback Drift was launched in 2017. Okay, and so, Talk to me a little bit about that time. Was that 2018, 2018. <coughs> um, a little bit about that time? Was there ever a time? I mean, obviously, starting something new is always there's always a, obviously sense of uncertainty. Um, you know, obviously, your experience brings a lot to the table uh, that it's going to turn out well. But were there times when it's like, hey, you know, how is this going to be perceived? Or was it you just knew 100 percent with your kind of gut and the, the, the void that you feel needed to be filled, that this was going to be a success. Andrew, it was a roller coaster ride. It has been a roller coaster ride of emotions and uh, of risk and of ups and downs. Um, uh, I'm lucky enough to have a team around me that, uh, that really all believe in the brand. And, uh, it's helped us really through, through, through the harder times, um, I would say one of the bigger, bigger risk was the, one of the bigger risks was the development of, of the fastback drift, because we didn't know at that time if people would buy into the brand at that price level, and uh, so that that was a, a big risk. It was a, a leap of faith. At the same time, I want to say that. When you have Boshe as a partner, you know that they're going to deliver quality. And um, when I saw the first prototypes, I was I was convinced that that people would would understand what what we were trying to accomplish with that watch. That it was um, in a lot of ways it was uh, our love letter to 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 the watch industry, our our love letter to to to, to watch making the, this piece, you know. And, uh, and, and, uh, and effectively, though, the watch really did very well. People really um, understood. We got a lot of support. And, uh, and uh, yeah, now we're on our, on our third series. <clears throat> the, the drift is only the beginning. It, 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 it's obviously given, given us the confidence to, to uh, explore even further. And so... Uh, Fascinating. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I know that there is, uh, you've given me a, a few hints of, of what's to come. I know it, it's not out yet and, and, and you can't share it. Uh, but it, when, when does that look like uh, it, would be, it would be launched so people can, uh, can kind of get excited for that? Yeah, well, we're, we're really excited about uh, uh, a new piece that we'll be unveiling um, this summer. Uh, it's going to be our, our big launch of the year. And uh, again, rallying around a, a group of passionate people to help us bring this together. And um, uh, during these challenging times, I think it's, um, it's we bringing in something fresh and kind of from a different angle is always a, is a, is always a good thing, I think. What I'm gathering from the conversation is <clears throat> you always have new executions of pieces, but it seems like there will always be this, um, you know, if you look at the Vaucher movement and this piece that you're talking about coming in in the summer, it seems like that and listening to you talk about innovation and uh, and pushing the boundaries, that that is part of the forward thinking of you guys as a brand, that what is the next thing that we can offer that uh, that keeps people wanting more. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's in our it's a reflex for me to to continuously 
um, rethink things. So uh, whether it's the fastback collections, but also now the new outlaw range that we, we uh, introduced uh, last year, uh, we are absolutely convinced that uh, by continuously building these two new uh, these two collections, that uh, that people will continue to uh, to to yeah we have to stay relevant you know we have to stay relevant and and to do that we have to continuously be creative and offer and offer new uh, alternatives yes uh, I mean as you know just as well as I do being in this business um, that relevancy is what's going to keep moving forward where I think a lot of brands that get comfortable or don't reinvent themselves that's when pieces or when brands kind of just fall out of favor and nobody's looking for that brand anymore because it's not something that is catching people's attention so i think um you know as long as we've been working together and that's a big reason why um from the numerous conversations that we've had is where i see that brand just having so much staying power and uh and really uh, this being the, the launch pad for uh, what the future looks like. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's true. And, and product is only one, one, it's a very important component, but obviously uh, communication is another one. And there too, uh, again, to come back to, to Lucas's role within the company, um, having the, having the, 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 the savoir faire, to be able to communicate with with uh, with uh, audiences and uh, and uh, show them new offerings is is uh, uh, the way that that uh, that we do at Gorilla uh, through the, the, the various di digital platforms, but also also supporting our retailers with the same savoir faire. So really being able to 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 give them an edge. When, when possible, uh, to be able to, to drive also uh, perhaps untapped markets, uh, untapped clients, um, untapped ter territories into their into their boutiques. These sorts of things are are uh, are the future, and I think working together with retailers that that um, that understand that that things are changing, right? That the that um, that the whole landscape is evolving into something new. And morphing and uh, uh, and the digital so the digital domain the digital realm is is really a key also in in, in uh, promoting the brand currently and also sharing our our future aspirations with, with our clients question that I wanted to ask you <clears throat> and it's a good segue um, in that kind of change in the way people are buying and um, buying behavior especially like in younger generations and specifically to watches, right? Because there's a lot of risks that have been moved over to an Apple watch. Um, and that's just, you know, there's a huge segment of the of the population that are just tied to their Apple watch because it connects to the phone and it connects, gives them fitness information. How do you see, or what have you seen in the changes um, in your kind of career, like in that demographic, in that shifting? Like, do you see that as a big issue or do you see people that are always going to have this appreciation for uh, mechanical timekeeping and uh, something that's not an Apple Watch, for example. Mm -hmm. I would say that when I when I started in the industry back in 1999, um, it was it was a more uh, um, aficionado uh, uh, trade the, the watch industry and watches uh you had to sort of be in you had to be in the know and you had to uh, your dad had, had had to have had a watch i had no idea about watches until i until i i, I studied design here in switzerland uh, it was it was the, the first time i was really ever exposed to you know real watchmaking per se before that it was just um more uh, uh sports accessory or something you know for for me it was never, I never even considered it as a career path, by the way, uh, watch, watches, watch design. Absolutely not. 
Uh, I wanted to go back to the U.S. and design sneakers. <laughs> I thought that was a, a cooler route, you know. So it, it just so happened that being in Switzerland, you, you're obviously you're exposed to the industry, right? And and then you you start understanding the the complexity of of these um, of these movements and and um, and the, and the craftsmanship behind these these pieces uh, and um, the boldness of, of some of the brands, especially when you're younger and you and you're and you're you're intrigued by things like carbon and ceramic and or young at heart at least and um, and so and so all of those elements start start and I, I don't think any of that has changed today. I think that the younger generation is just as intrigued by by that that um, that same those same magical elements that make up the watch a, a watch a mechanical watch and so whether whether it's you know whether it's a miyota or or a, uh or 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 a high end swiss caliber by the way you know i mean the the beating heart of a of a of a of a balance wheel is 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 a magical thing and so i i think that um i understand the idea that is somehow um the the apple watch is sort of uh, stealing away uh, wrists from from potential mechanical watch buyers, but I just think that um, in any case, from my experience with Gorilla, we have a very young audience. We have we have clients that start at 19 years old, even younger, and uh, that love the brand that that don't necessarily look at it first as a mechanical watch brand that. That come in through a different angle. Maybe it's the material, maybe it's the design, maybe it's the brand world, but that ultimately begin to understand deeper and 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 begin to appreciate the analog experience of a mechanical watch. You know, and um, and that's the gateway. And so and 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 then they and then they discover the drift, and that just blows their mind. They, how do you read it? And and then a dialogue begins. You know. And and you take the time you explain, and people are fascinated with it. So and it's true that social media has 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 changed in a lot of ways the, the, the attention span that we have when we're going through through our Instagram feed. But I think our watches have stopping power. You know, our our pictures. We work hard. We curate our pictures so so that people. People, you know, look twice at what we're up to. And then it's our job to, from there, as soon as we have a question, as soon as somebody is interested, um, that we take the time to respond and, and interact and, and share. Um, it's uh, it's uh, one click at a time. And one person and one question at a time, you know. So, so I think that there's absolutely, uh, I don't I don't see that, that, um, sort of migration of, 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 of millennials towards some kind of digital alternative to mechanical watches. I see complementary um, complementary things between an Apple watch and, and what we're doing. Well, I, I'm, I'm curious, like we look at the watch industry as, as a whole at the moment and it's the brands like the, you know, the Rolex and, and AP and Patek that have these, you know, the Royal Oak or the Nautilus or the Submariner. Um, what do you think other than just it being a limited production? Because obviously that is an issue with, you know, you can't just go out and easily find some of these watches. But what creates that that demand um, so that something is just so, people just want it and they will pay uh, well over retail for for some of these watches like obviously design goes into it and it has to be i mean it has to be a piece that just is um pleasing to everybody but i just i'm curious of, of your opinion of that yeah well, i think that um i think a big component uh in, in, in the in your question is is design uh, design is is a bit i mean these houses are 130, 40 years old houses, right? Uh, it takes a long time to build a brand that people trust. And, and I think that it, 
if you want, um, without necessarily considering a Patek Philippe or, or an Audemars Piguet, I think that brand building is about building trust with, with, your, with your customers and, and fulfilling your promise to them, right? Because they're giving you their hard-earned money, their hard-earned money. And so they're expecting in return your promise, what, what, you're, what you're saying that you're going to deliver. And so uh, that takes a long time to get that trust. And it can easily be, you can easily lose that trust through a mistake or through uh, negligence or whatever it is. So, um, uh, so I think that these, these brands have, and then, then obviously you mentioned iconic products like not, the, the Nautilus and, uh, and the Royal Oak and, uh, and uh, Rolex in, in and of itself is an iconic iconic brand uh, beyond watchmaking even um, and, and uh, I mean I, I think design is a, is, a, is a very important part in the um, in, this, in the iconic status of, 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 of these these particular products Nautilus and Royal Oak they just happen to be designed by the same guy on top of that um, so, uh, and, and delivering on the promise, those are the, the, the two principal ingredients, I would say, that, that make these pieces so desirable. Obviously, I mean, um, when you want to deliver that level of quality, uh, you're automatically constrained to a certain quantity per year. So that creates rarity. And uh, that's the, the, I would say, the third component in, in the in the in the in, in in creating an iconic status product like like the Royal Oak or or the Nautilus, I think that the way that you guys um, operate and and the way that you guys introduce new pieces, um, especially like the GTs and uh, into some of the drifts, they for the most part are are limited edition. So it could be 250, 300, 500 pieces. But once that is done, the watch goes away. Um, and, you know, I, I, I was, the reason I was asking that question is obviously as the future of Gorilla uh, grows and you want to continue that uh, so that in 20, 30, 50 years, 100 years, Gorilla is still around. And it's you having that, um, that exposure to some of the these brands that are a hundred years old, um, I guess gives you the, the edge over, uh, a lot of other brands. I, I, I would, I would, uh, I hope so. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. No, um, obviously having, having, having had the experience that I had puts us, puts us in a unique position, right? It, um, uh, I, I would love to, to imagine that, 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 that the brand could, could last a uh, hundred years. That would be wonderful. I hope it does. We're, we're working very hard today um, uh, to, be proud of what, to be proud of what we're doing, right? Just to be proud of what we're doing and know that uh, we're doing our due diligence to deliver. That, that's, that's the first thing. And if we can do that right already, I'm 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 very happy. Uh, uh, and then um, I think it's about maintaining the cap uh, in in our strategy. And and again, it's also it goes beyond what we're doing here at, at headquarters. It's also what you're doing on the ground. It's also what our partners in Japan are doing. And so it's a it's a network of people all moving in the same direction. You know, all with the same vision and all with the same aspiration. That that's how that's how brands um, last through through the through the good times and through the hard times. It's with strong partnerships. Well, I definitely appreciate you uh, you taking your valuable time and being able to let me ask you some questions because I know it's uh, there are people out there that are really interested. It's great to see uh, the direction of the brand, um, and I think everybody looks forward to these uh these big launches that are coming and uh and what's new and exciting coming from gorilla <clears throat> andrew it's a pleasure talking to you always 
Thank you. Uh, I hope to see yeah, you soon. In person, hopefully soon. Yeah. Yes, in person, out in Florida. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I look forward. I look forward to working with you uh, when when things uh, start opening yeah. up more. Sounds great. And uh, in the meantime, I wish you the thank best. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you for taking the yeah. time too, man. I All appreciate right. it. All right. Well, uh, Octavio Garcia, uh, thanks so much, and uh, we'll uh, see you soon.